Praise the Lord, everyone. Good evening. It is well with you in Jesus' name. If the sound is good, please let me know that the sound is good. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Our Father, we bless your name this afternoon. We give you all the glory, honor, and praise. You are the Lord. You never change. We thank you for the privilege to come to learn at your feet. Holy Spirit, we pray that you have your way today. We pray for divine understanding, revelation of your word. Let it be given unto us, O God. Holy Spirit, we pray that you expand your word, break it down, help us to understand. Give us the tongue of the learned in the name of Jesus Christ. So at the end of it all, you may take all the glory and we'll be ready for the assignment that you have for us, O God, in the name of Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit, be our teacher today. Feed us with manna from heaven and with the bread of life. So at the end of it all, you take all the glory. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, praise God. Let's uh, let me welcome us back to <laughs> not the gospel. Uh, I know many of us we are having a tough time with this class. One thing I know is we will do well in Jesus' name. So we are going to chapter fifteen, structuralism and deconstruction. Structuralism and deconstruction. Hmm. Structuralism. See, the search for the author's intention was abandoned by those literary critics who regarded it as fallacious. So what we're trying to do in this chapter, we're looking for, we remember what we did with our previous class. So I hope we still remember what we did with our previous class. So what we're trying to do is to look for the alternative. We are looking for the alternative to reduction criticism. So let's look for another way to understand the scripture, another, another method. Uh, somebody sent me an email and said, I studied and studied, I still don't get it. I don't know why they are arguing. Don't forget what we said in the beginning. What we're trying to do, we're trying to investigate. We're trying to break down. We're trying to see what is going on. So whenever you pick up your Bible to read any gospel among the synoptics, so you will, you will have a better understanding. You know the foundation. You know how it came together. You know how it was written. So whenever you want to speak, whenever you want to preach, whenever you want to teach from this passage, you have a better understanding than just a lay member in the church that have not been where you are right now. That's what makes the difference. That's what makes the difference. Uh, and when anyone, probably you turn on your TV or somebody's on the pulpit preaching and you realize that, what they are preaching, they are actually going wrong. It's not for you to say anything, but on the inside of you, you know that that's a wrong interpretation. So that's the point. That's what we're trying to do. So that we can live, like we read last time, what Apostle Paul wrote to, uh, the, in the book of Hebrews, so we can live that, um, how can I put it? An elementary stage. We can leave the elementary stage when it comes to your relationship with the Lord and your Christianity, your your Christian journey. It is time. Many of us have been you been in the Lord now for many years, for decades, but we are still at the same level. But this time around, you're taking another step to move to another level. So wherever you stand, when you speak, people will know that the, this person that is speaking has the knowledge of the scripture. So that's what makes the difference. That's what makes the difference. 
we will not be afraid to speak anywhere. We will not be afraid to grab the Bible and shake it and interpret it and speak from it. You can speak with boldness like Peter did on the day of Pentecost. Why? Because you have a little bit of knowledge of what you are talking about. I always tell everyone, if you want to become a lawyer, you go to school to study for it. If you want to become a doctor, you spend eight years. After you finish all the regular classes, you spend eight years to study medicine. If you want, even if you want to become a barber, you go to school for it. Then we'll tell you that if you want to become a minister, you don't need to go to school to study for it. <laughs> Many of us say, oh, Holy Spirit is my teacher. It's my teacher too. So, but we need to study because what we study is what the Holy Spirit, we interpret, we help us to understand. The Holy Spirit will remind us, but if we don't have anything in our reservoir, what is it that you want the Holy Spirit to draw out from? So that's why it's very important. Just hanging in there, you will understand it. You will. Praise God. All right. So we are looking for another method of interpretation, another method of studying the scripture. That's why we want to look at how it is structured and how they can deconstruct it. Structuralism and deconstruction. So let's, let's get into it. So the search for the author's intention was abandoned by those literary critics who regarded it as fallacious. And when we look at them very well, I put one or two together, I realized that the law of amenuetics was rejected. What is the law of amenuetics? The law of amenuetics tells us that for you to have uh, a better understanding of the scripture or for you to know the actual, the genuine interpretation of a passage, you need to know the intention of the author. What, what is the intent of the author's art? What is in it? What was he thinking about when that passage was written? What did God tell the author? Now, when we are talking about the author, we're stepping into ammonetics now. When we are talking about the author, we have two authors. We have divine author, then we have human author. When divine author inspired human author to write, as human author was writing, there's some intention in his heart as well. There's something in his heart. That's not part of what God told him that is going to reflect in his writing. It's like if you tell me something now and you want me to tell somebody else, the way I will present to that person is going to be a little bit different. Why? Because I am me and you are you. So that's when it comes to the interpretation of the scripture, we realize that at this point, when it comes to structuralism, they rejected completely the law of amenetics. So they're taking us in another route. Instead of us knowing the intent of the author's heart, they're trying to take us into, how can I put a technical part of Bible interpretation. So let's see where they are taking us. It says, since questions of reference are abandoned, the method takes no interest in history. If you remember, our class last week, reduction criticism. For you to criticize the redacted, you have, if you remember that class, you have to go to, you have to dig deep, you have to go back in history to find out what actually happened before I can stand against these redactors. I want to know what actually happened. Did they do the right thing? So as though I editing all these passages, did they do the right thing? And for me to understand that, I have to study the original language. I have to be able to know what happened when Jesus walked the earth, what happened when Luke was writing his gospel, what happened when John, when Matthew, when Mark was writing, when they were writing their gospels, what actually happened? 
I must be able to go and put my feet in Peter's shoes. So we have to be able to go down in history and find out the truth. But here, since questions of reverence are abandoned, the method takes no interest in history. They just want to interpret the scripture based on technicality. So let's see. He said the approach is synchronic, not diachronic. That is, it treats the text as a unified all existing at one unspecified time and does not probe it to discover earlier section or later accretion, as reduction criticism does. And the method seems to free interpreter from relativism of historical study. So you don't have to worry about that. Let's look, let's look into our own method. That's what they're trying to do. All those we are going back to dig and dig and find out the truth, whatever it is that has happened in the past, they didn't want to go through all that. But the question now is, will they still, with this method, still be able to give us the actual and accurate interpretation of the scripture? So we're going to find that out. We want to see an example of this by this guy called Jade Voilord. He wrote an article titled Exercise on some short stories. His essay, The New Testament and Structuralism, discovers the underlying structure in the miracle, in the miracle story of the healing of two blind men. That is found in the book of Matthew, chapter 9, verses 27 to 31. Let's quickly look, let's let's look into it. Matthew 9, 27. To 31. See, and when Jesus departed thence, two blind men followed him, crying and saying, Thou son of David, have mercy on us. And when he was coming to the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus said unto them, Believe ye that I'm able to do this? They said unto him, Yes, Lord. Then touch ye their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be, be, be it unto you. And their eyes were open, and Jesus straightly charged them, saying, See that no man know it. But they, when they were departed, spread abroad his fame in all that country. So we're going to look at the structure how this method put together the structure of this miracle that we just read, the miracle of the healing of the two blind men. So is that this structure, as we see, you will see some other that we will look into in a few minutes with variation. It's the same structure, but we have a little bit of change here and there, but they are following the same pattern. He said, this structure with variation is then discerned in, in other biblical narratives of miracles, parables, and prophetic proclamation. It is the particular structure of binary opposition, which gives the story its meaning as a contract. As a contract. Please, I want you to underline that. It, it gives the story its meaning as a contract. All right. Let's let's look at the one we just talked about, the miracle of the healing of two blind men. Look at the breakdown. I know you have it in your notebook as well. You can either either look at the uh, presentation or look at it in your notebook. When we look at the notebook in page 226, 
in the first paragraph at the bottom of it. It says the meta seems to free the interpreter from the relativism of historical study while providing a scientific analysis of text which ex exclude subjective consideration. The binary opposition seems scientific to a generation learning to use computer. So that's what they're trying to do now to interpret the scripture or to understand the scripture. Now let's look at the breakdown. This guy, J. Lord, you see, it described the structure of the eating of the two blind men at two levels. The first, less abstract, and the second, more abstract. At the first level, the analysis is as follows. We have D1 and D2, which indicate the binary opposites of the story's stru structure. Jesus on the one end, and the two blind men on the other. So let's look at the breakdown. Conjunction. On that conjunction, you see the situation that is time and space. The stage is set. D1 represents Jesus, and D2 represents the two blind men. The Bible says, as Jesus passed on from there, the stage has been set, Jesus is on the stage, then who is going to enter into this stage with him? To act or to enter into an agreement or to enter into a contract, because based on this view, based on this study of this guy, J. V. Lord, he sees everything as a contract. And how do they enter into a contract? And how do they get out of the contract? And how do they settle the contract? How is the contract established? Now, Jesus is on the stage. Then now, entrance on the stage are the two blind men. They enter the stage. Look at it. The two blind men followed him. Two blind men followed him. Then let's look at stage two, the contract. Don't forget it takes two to form a contract, to establish a contract. Because a contract is not unilateral, it's bilateral. When you put together a document until all parties involved sign it, that's when it becomes a contract. We need at least two people or more to establish a contract. So now, the first thing we see on the stage now is a request from D2. That means the two blind men crying and saying, have pity on us, son of David. King James Version says, have mercy on us, son of David. So that they make a request that does not make a contract, does not establish a contract. Now, this reminds me when I was in real estate, if anyone is a real estate agent or broker or whatever it is, you know what I'm talking about right now. When you, when you make an offer, I would like to buy your house. When you present an offer, if the owner, the seller of the house, then change anything in the, on the offer and just sign it. Then that offer change, it changes from being an offer to an accepted offer, which makes a contract. But if anything, if you change anything in that offer, that does not make it a contract. It makes it, uh, how can I put it? Uh, because right now is the seller that is now making an offer to you. You as a buyer, you made an offer and the seller now presents an offer back to you. Yes, what you said I should do, I would do that, I would sell this also amount, but 
I refuse to pay this amount on the closing cost. I refuse to do what you ask me to do right here. If you agree with what I just did, sign it, initial all the changes, then we have a contract. So that's what Jesus did right here. Because when they made a request, the, the Bible said the crying saying, have pity on us, son of David. Jesus now make a conditional response. The Bible says, when he arrived at the house, the blind men approached him, and Jesus said to them, do you believe I can do this? He didn't just lay hands on them. He didn't just say you are healed. No. He said, do you believe I can do this? When he gave them, he made an offer to them, Right that they didn't change anything, they accepted it. Said they said to him, Yes, Lord, yes, Lord. So at that point, no, come on. So at that point, the contract was established. The contract was established. Because the consequences of what he just did is the is the establishment of the contract. Because what Jesus offered them was accepted. So right here, you see D1 and D2, that was both of them are on the same page. Heal us. Do you think I can do it? Yes, we know you can do it. Then we have a contract. Then let's look at the realization. That is stage three. The implementation of the means. We have gesture and speech. What is the gesture? The Bible said, then he touched their eyes. You see, that is D1. That is Jesus acting right here. He touched their eyes. Then the speech saying, let it be done to you according to your faith. Let it be done to you according to your faith. Then what's the result of that? D1, that is these two blind men, they realized that what they asked for took place. Miracle happened because their eyes were hoping. Their eyes were hoping. Now, stage four. Because now Jesus is now giving them a new offer. This is a new contract entirely. Because the first contract is being realized. Everything is done. Now Jesus make a new offer, giving them a new contract. That is stage four, retribution or recompense. And what is what Jesus offered them? A warning. And Jesus sternly ordered them saying, do not tell anyone. Do not tell anyone. But at this time, did you they violated that contract. They broke it. Jesus told them not to tell anyone, but they couldn't keep this miracle to themselves. They began to glorify the name of the Lord. The Bible said, but having departed, they told it to all the countryside there. They told everyone they could meet, everyone. Then stage five, disjunction. They both left. The blind man left. Jesus left the scene. They both left the scene. But, but, the two blind men broke the second contract. Broke the second contract. Praise the Lord. So, at this point, before we continue, how many of us have a little understanding of the uh, contractual method that we just explained? So it's better than the previous class. <laughs> okay, if you see, if you still don't understand the method we just explained, please let me know. Let me know now before we continue. If you still don't understand the contractual method that we just explained. And so, so, hmm. 
God bless you, Sister Desiree. Thank you. That's that's the word I was looking for that I forget. Counter offer. Yes, counter offer. Thank you. So we we will look at another example. You we Sister. What's her name again? Give me a minute, uh, Sister Michelle. You 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 will you you will you will understand it. You will understand it. So God bless you, Sister Ramona. I say I understand the contract agreement. Amen. Uh, Sister Joy say not quite. Okay. It's okay, Sister Queen say this seems better. Oh, praise God for that. Amen. Okay. We are getting there. We are getting there one one session at a time. All right. So now let's look at the one we just explained. The healing of uh, two blinds. He said, the hardest part of this analysis is the description of section four as retribution or recompense since it consists of Jesus' warning and the revelation or glorification of Jesus by the, by the two men after the healing, which is actually the violation of Jesus' prohibition. They violated it. That is, it could be more aptly described as a second contract which was broken. It was broken. They breached the second contract. They breached the second contract. Mm. All right. See, the logic I'm reading from page 227 now, at the bottom of the page. He said, the logic of the contract that is in the second stage, the logic of the contract, which is number two above, is then more fully explored by v -Lord. The contract may involve either a demand or a prohibition. It may be expressed from the perspective of the sender who gives an order or forbid the receiver to act. If he gives another, the possibilities are again twofold, expressed grammatically as follows. Let's quickly look at that before we go to the healing of uh, the paralytic. Let's come, go, on, go to page 228 on your textbook. Let's look at the diagram right there. You see the demand at the top of the pyramid. Then it, it can go either way. Demand can be accepted or refused. If demand is accepted, then what happens? The realization, what you are requesting for, what you are demanding will take place. Let's look at, let me go back a little bit. Let's look at the example of uh, the healing of the two blinds. Because they all agreed. What happened right there? Realization, what was the realization? Their eyes opened. Jesus touched their eyes, and their eyes were opened. So that is the result, the, the recompense. That's, that's, that's the outcome, the result, the blessing that come out of it, because they accepted the demand, they realized the result, and it, it manifested. They received their miracle. But if you refuse the demand, Guess what follow? No realization what you want to happen will not happen. Instead of recompense, what is going to follow? Punishment. Punishment. If, our, if Jesus Christ is not the Lord of mercy, if you're not a merciful Lord, because they broke that agreement, punishment supposed to follow. Because Jesus told them, do not tell anyone. But they couldn't keep that miracle to themselves. They told everyone they could meet. 
But let me give you an example. If it's like the Old Testament, if you break that kind of contract, you will pay the price. You pay the price. But we thank God for his grace and mercy. So that's why nothing happened. That's why nothing happened. Say, if the sender forbid to receive, I mean, if the sender forbid the receiver to act, again, the possibility are two folds. Again, the possibility are two folds. Let's, now let's look at the top of the pyramid. Prohibition. To the left, we see the violation, the realization was the result of that punishment. But if they had respected what Jesus asked them not to do, if they respected that command, it's a prohibition when Jesus says, don't do that, don't tell anyone. They respect it, what follow? No realization because nothing is going to happen. Then when nothing happens, what is going to be the result? Recompense because they kept what he told them not to do. They kept that contract. They will be rewarded for keeping that contract. When it comes to what will happen, nothing, nothing because they didn't do anything. He told them not to do anything. And they didn't do anything, so nothing will happen. And they will be rewarded because nothing happened. Because the instruction is, do not tell anyone. Don't tell anyone. Praise God. So, now, let's move to the second example. Let's look at the healing of the, uh, the paralytic. Matthew chapter 9. Uh, verses 1 to 8. See, and he entered into a ship and passed over and he came into his own city. And behold, they brought to him a man sick of palsy. Let me read another translation. He said, Jesus got into a boat, crossed the sea, and came to his own city. Some people brought him a paralyzed man on his stretcher. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the man, cheer up, friend, your sins are forgiven. There's one thing that I want us to pay attention here, though. Remember, in the beginning, we talk about some variation that you will find in different story and different miracle, different accounts. There's one variation right here. Because these people that brought this paralyzed man, they're a little bit different from the other miracle because the blind men, they cried to Jesus, help us, help us, son of David, help us, have mercy. But these people, they didn't say any word. They didn't say a word. They didn't say anything. See, some people brought him a paralyzed man on a stretcher. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the man, cheer up, friend, your sins are forgiven. Then some of the scribes thought is dishonoring God. Now, let's, because of those that said they didn't understand it, as, uh, they didn't understand it much, the first example. Let me explain this in a better way. When Jesus came across the sea, he appeared on the stage. He said the stage, he appeared. Then we see the second group of people that appear on the stage. These are the people that brought the paralyzed man and the paralyzed man. They are the second group. If you want to assign letter D, now we have D1, we have D2. Now in verse three, we have D3. Because now we have another set of people that entered into the stage. These are the scribes. Are we getting it now? These are the scribes. They enter the stage. And when they enter the stage, they are not looking for help. They wanted to cause trouble. <laughs> Jesus entered the stage as problem solver. The second group entered the stage with a problem. 
But the third group enter the stage, they don't have problem. They don't solve problem. They want to create problem. Now, in verse 4, Jesus knew what they were thinking. He asked them, why are you thinking evil things? Is it easier to say your sins are forgiven or to say get up and walk? I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sin. Then he said to the paralyzed man, get up, pick up your stretcher and go home. So the man got up and went home. When the crowd saw this, they were filled with awe and praised God for giving such authority to humans. All right. Now let's look at the breakdown again. This time around, I hope we have a better understanding. You see, the conjunction, the first stage, time and space, that is the situation. Jesus said the stage. He said, and getting into a boat, he, that's Jesus, crossed over and came to his own city. Now, D2, entering the stage. The Bible says, and behold, they brought to him a paralytic lying on his bed. Let's look at the second stage or the second level, the contract. Like I explained a little, a uh, few minutes ago, these people, they didn't ask for it. They just brought the man. So, yes, it's a request, but this is assumed, but, but not stated. It wasn't stated. We don't have it in writing in the Bible that they asked for help. They just believe, they assume that but Jesus saying their friend, he will know that he needs help. And that's exactly what happened. The initial response. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. We still don't have contract yet. Why? Because that's a dispute. That's when D3 entered into the stage. And now these are the scribes. The Bible says, and behold, some of the scribes said to themselves, this is blasphemy. We still don't have a contract yet. Now Jesus challenged them. He challenged their, the dispute. He challenged the accusation, it challenged their question, whatever they have in mind. And what Jesus now said at this point neutralized all the challenges, the disputes, whatever it is, to form a contract. Because based on this view, for that miracle to take place, there had to be a contract. Everybody had to agree. And Jesus challenged, he challenged the, the scribes. He said, but Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, why do you think evil in your heart? For which is easier to say, rise and walk? But you may know, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sin. When Jesus said that we, we don't have any record that the scribes challenge Jesus again or disputed whatever he says or whatever it is, no, that settles it. Now that forms a contract because right now everybody agrees. When it comes to the scribes, their silence means agreement. It means that they agree because if they disagree, they would say it. They would say something. Because what Jesus just told them, they have no way, no how to argue that. Now, the consequence is the contract, the establishment of a contract. All right. Level three, we see realization. The implementation of the means. When we are looking at gesture, there is no gesture because Jesus didn't touch him. He didn't lay hands on him. He didn't do anything. He just spoke. He told him what to do. He then sent to the paralytic, rise, take up your bed, and go home. And go home. Then what's the result? 
he rose and he went home. Let's look at level four, retribution or recompense. There's another variation in, compa in comp if we compare it to the last miracle that we studied. The last one, Jesus gave them a warning. But at this point, there's no warning. No warning. What follows, what follows here is glorification. And this glorification that we are talking about, this is another a little variation right here. It's not the man that was healed that is now glorified God. It's the people that are around that saw what God did, that saw what Jesus did. The first one is those people that received the miracle. They're the ones that are now making the announcements all over the place. But this time around, are uh, the witnesses, those people that witnessed what Jesus did, they are the one going about telling everybody and giving glory to the name of the Lord. He said, when the crowd saw it, they were afraid and they glorified God who had given such authority to men. Now, let's look at the assessment uh, of the Lord's analysis. There are still more examples. Based on what we, the way we just explained this, I want you to go back and look at the remaining example in your textbook and try to understand. It's the same pattern, the same strategy. We just have a little variation in it. All right. Assessment of uh, the Lloyd's analysis. The Lord has discovered a basic structure which is exhibited in many of the stories in Matthew's gospel. And next we are in other biblical passages. And the application of the structure helps to bring to light the slight variation from one example to another, like we just saw. So there is no doubt that this kind of analysis is very satisfying is very satisfying. Okay. Let me look at our faces right here, and I want to see your response. Is it very satisfying to you as well? You have a better understanding with this strategy compared to uh, the, the, our last class. Okay. I see somebody is nodded. Do, do I see some is there other people nodding as well? Okay, praise God. Amen. <laughs> Pastor, I have a four forty five minutes to prepare for God bless you. Amen. A little better. What page in textbook are you on now? I'm on page two thirty three. Someone say yes, it's much better now. Okay, praise God. Praise God. So out of how uh, many, out of uh, 14 people here right now, three or four people responded. That's, that's good enough for me. <laughs> Praise God. So it reduces, this method, it reduces a mass of incoherent detail into variation of a simple structure of binary opposition. It replaces chaos with clarity. Right? It overcomes modern humanism with, with scientific precision <clears throat> because it breaks it down. It breaks it down. If you can follow this, you'll be able to break down any miracles, any prophecy, or whatever it is in the synoptic. Not only in the synoptic, in the Bible. To be able to have a better understanding. The first thing you need to do is set the stage. Who is the first person that entered the stage? Look at the characters of the play, the character of the show. How many characters do we have? What role do, we, do they play? Do they have a contract and what's the outcome of it? By doing this, you will have a better understanding of the scripture. Praise God. Amen. Let's look at second example. This second example is the view of 
G. Jeanette. Jeanette's study of time and focus in Proust explores the binary relation which exists between the story on the other hand and the narrative in which it is told on the other. Mm. I want to I want to read from our textbook. He said it's careful elucidation of possible relation between any narrative and any story in terms of time and focus allows us once again to see what kind of selection the gospel narratives are making. It provides a grid which can be placed over them so that we can see both with both what is present and what is absent. Praise God. He said, no attempt can be made here to present genetic studies in all its uh, subtlety. What follows will be a brief sketch of those points relevant to the literary, trans literary relation within the synoptic gospel. His account of time is divided into three sections, order, duration, and frequency. Order, duration, and frequency. All right, let's look at order. See, order concerns the possible relations between the temporal order of event in the story and the pseudo-temporal order of the arrangement in the narrative. See, sometimes the temporal relation between one event and another is left open, is left open. And I want us to look at the example. Before we look at the example of that, let's, let's go back to the first point. Let's look at the example of the first point. He said, these two orders may coincide as they very often do in the synoptic gospels. Although the, prog the progress of time is marked vaguely with and, after this, and again. On the other end, they may not. Now let's look at the example. He said, Mark relate the meeting of Jesus with a spirit-possessed man in Mark uh, 5, verse 2, and then give, gives account of the man's life before the meeting took place. So do, do we get that? Okay. Let, let, let's look at another example, an example of John the Baptist's death. John the Baptist's death is assumed to be an accomplished fact in Mark 6.14. And later, the way in which he came to die is described. That means the old story is, is, is the story was told backward. That means the end was told before the beginning. The result was discussed before they discussed the process, how they get the results. Are we getting it now? Yeah. So the, the man, that man that the spirit possessed, the Bible talked about him, but then later on, the Bible talks about how it get to that point. Let me give us another example that we are related, that we, we have a little bit better understanding. Come with me into the Old Testament because I have a very good example in the Old Testament. The book of First Chronicles, chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. He said, Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. And his mother named him Jabez, which means painful, because she said that his birth was painful. Jabez prayed to the God of Israel, please bless me and give me more territory. May your power be with me and free me from evil so that I will not be in pain. God gave him what he prayed for. Verse 10 supposed to be verse 9, and verse 9 supposed to be verse 10. If you want to read it in chronological order. 
because it was after he prayed and God gave him what he prayed for, that's when he became more honorable than his brother. So are we getting it now? Now let's go, let's go back to the synoptic. So the example of John the Baptist, uh, the Bible talk in, in Mark 16, 14, it talked about the death of John the Baptist. But it didn't tell us the way he died until chapter 6, verses 17 to 29. That's what we're supposed to read for us, that will lead to his death. But we first read about his death, then later on how he died. So are we, are we getting it now? So when, whenever you're reading a passage like that, when you get there, you know the method to, to translate that. That is G. Genet. So he came up with this method, with this view, that, oh, it's supposed to be this way. If you want to read it in chronological order. And... At this point, I will make another recommendation. Let me see if I have it here. I don't think I have it here. Yes, I do. Okay. I will recommend, as a Bible student, that you purchase this Bible. Let me bring it down. <laughs> it's called a chronological study Bible. It doesn't have to be this. Just get a chronological Bible. Because with this Bible, it put the entire Bible together the way it happened in chronological order. When you open your Bible from the beginning, you will not see Genesis 1.1. Because there are some events that happened before, way before Genesis 1-1. Praise God. So you'll be able to read it the way it actually happened. You will see John 1-1 before you see Genesis 1-1. And when you read and finally see Genesis 1-1, between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2, you will see Ezekiel 28. Because that's the event that happened between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14. That's when Lucifer fell and his name was changed to Satan. And that happened between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. Praise God. So I would recommend that you get this Bible. Like I told us, as we are going in the different classes, when you get to each point, I will let you know a book that I will recommend that I know will be very, very good to, for you to have it in your library. Not to decorate the library, but to read it. <laughs> <laughs> because it's one thing to buy it, it's another thing to really study it. What's the name of the author? This particular one. This is not just a book, it's a Bible. So we don't have the name of the author. So it's a Bible, it's a study Bible. So just look for, so what I would do, uh, I will take a picture of it and send it to us. How about that? I'll take a picture of the cover and I will send it to us. So that will be a blessing. All right. So where are we? So it says sometimes the temporal relation between one event and another is left open. Example of this. So it is not clear exactly when Judas committed suicide or the priest or the chief priest bought the feed with the money he returned. 
in relation to the time of Jesus' trial before Pilate. You know, it was way, 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 way. That was in the, the end of the book of John and uh, the uh, chapter one of the book of Acts of the Apostles that we now realize that Judas bought a piece of land. When he bought it, we had no clue because we don't have the record. When he went to give money, that, that I think we lost you, man of God. The camera just gave up on me, but can you hear me now? <laughs> now, now we can hear you. We lost you again. Can you see me and hear me now? Yes, man of God. Praise God. I didn't know the camera was unplugged and the battery died. All right, where are we? So we are talking about the temporal relation between one event and another is left open. And we gave the example of when Judas committed suicide or when they are... Uh, the chief priest used that money to buy the land, the money that they returned to buy the land. We have no idea why, because we don't have any record. We have no record. So that was left hoping. It was left hoping. Mm. All right. So let's look at the, uh, the duration. So we just discussed order, the duration. So duration concerns the speed of the narratives. That is the relation between duration of events in the story and the length of the text in telling them. In the, the relation between the duration of event in the story and the length of the text in telling them, for example, Almost the all Jesus' ministry is related in Mark. In Mark chapter 1, verse 14 to 13, chapter, 30, um, chapter 13, verse 37. Why 
two complete chapters are devoted to the last few days of his life. So you see the length of the text in telling the story. When the entire three years, three and a half years of his ministry, we have that in 13 chapters. But two chapters for the last couple of days of his life. So that's what the duration is talking about when we are looking at the view and the method of J. J. Knight. And the last point in that is frequency. Frequency. Frequency concerns various types of repetition. The possibilities may be set out as follows. One, what happened once in the story is related once. Two, what happens more than once in the story is related the same number of times. Three, what happened once in the story is related more than once. And four, what happened more than once in the story is related once. But the synoptic gospels usually restrict themselves to the first two possibilities. That is, what happened once in the story is related once. What happened more than once in the story is related the same number of times. The same number of times. Mm. Now, all this while we've been talking about structuralism. Now let's look at deconstruction. Deconstruction. So the unsettling implications stems from philosophical position which structuralism espouses. That texts have only a relational, not an essential meaning. Only as a relational meaning, not an essential meaning. Mm. In this sense, all texts provide partial views. And it is important for the reader to notice what is not expressed in the text, what is absent, what the very shape of the text excludes from discussion. Once this is recognized, the structure begins to collapse and the text is deconstructed. And the text is deconstructed. So that is it for this evening. Is there any question? Oh, there's a lot of question now. Okay, camera is out. You are back. Amen. Let's see here, however, I'm able to see here. Are you okay? Signal gone. So we lost you. Thank God we're back. Praise God. So is there any question? What about chapter 16? We are not getting to chapter 16 today because okay. this is uh, 5.03 already. Uh, we remember that service is starting at 6. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes, yeah. yes. So um, I know many of us, we've read uh, chapter 16. Let's read chapter 17 for next week. So we're going to address, if time permits, we address uh, 16 and 17 next week. What about the YouTube videos? Uh, for the last week, we sent, I sent that out. The only one that is still missing was a video of Pastor Chris's class. Okay. Yeah. And if you don't, even if you don't receive the video that I sent out, as long as you subscribe to YouTube, just go on YouTube, it's there. Because once we, once we finish, the same evening, we always upload the video to the YouTube channel. Okay. Yes, ma'am. All right. Thank you. God bless and you. We, yes, ma'am. Do we have a paper due today? No. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. I've received from some. If I've not received yours, please send it over. Was it to raise chronological 
uh, Bible that you mentioned. Uh, let me check Riz. I, be, I know I used to have Riz. Let me check it in a minute. This Bible. Yes, Reese is good. I used to have I I gave it I gave it out to somebody. Okay. Yeah. Reese is good. So at, okay, that that's even this one is the one that shows us is not Reese, but Reese is very good. So for so I don't have to take a picture and send it anymore. You can just go ahead and get Reese Chronological Bible. Oh, you have Reese. Nice. Exactly. Nice. 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 Okay. So we can go ahead and get Reese if you're on the chat, so you will see it right there. Reese Chronological Bible. So I don't have to take a picture of this and send it over. The one that I have is uh, Thomas Nelson. Is Thomas Nelson? Let me let me type it there. If you want that, the chronological Bible. Sending it to everyone. Okay, right there. All right. So, is there any other question? So, if there's no question, we'll, we'll know what we are reading for next week. That will be chapter 16 and 17. I know many of us already read chapter 16, then let's read chapter 17. Then we'll take it from there. I am, I am just struggling with the paper. To summarize what I read, it, it's so dense and technical. I'm struggling with it. You will not struggle in Jesus' name. <laughs> just, just, just do your best. I will. I will. I'll send it tonight. <laughs> no, you'll be just fine. Amen. You'll be just fine. Praise God. It is well. Let us pray. Our Father, we bless your name tonight. We give you praise, honor, glory, and adoration. For you are the Lord and you never change. Here we are in your presence, O God. Everything that we have studied today, Holy Spirit, we pray that you expound it. Give us a better understanding, even more than our instructor, in the name of Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit, remind us everything we have studied. Remind us everything that we have learned. Let the anointing of East rest upon us. Begin to interpret every line. Begin to interpret every chapter so we have a better understanding. All to the glory of your name. Thank you, Father. And tonight's service, Holy Spirit, move in our midst like never before. Do what only you can do and let your name be glorified. Thank you, ancient of days. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you for coming.
follow the 